this is awesome. You know, I've been backstage listening to the speakers and the courage that I've heard them exhibit is awesome. Can we get a round of, a, a round of applause for our speakers? Thank you, thank you. So can I share something with you? I was mugged twice by gunpoint before the age of 11. The first time I got mugged, I was going to the barbershop. I was 10 years old. My mom gave me 20 bucks, and back then in the 80s, a haircut was $10. So I gave the barber 20 bucks. He gave me back $10, and that was it. See, back in those days in Harlem, there were a lot of stick-up kids, and one of them happened to be in the barbershop I was at. He saw a 10-year-old kid with $10 in his pocket, and I immediately became a mark. The barbershop was on 116th Street. I was on 110th Street. I, I uh, started walking home, noticed somebody following me. I sped up, he sped up. I went inside, I ran inside a local bodega and did something like, stranger danger, help me, stranger danger. And the owner didn't do anything. I waited inside that bodega for what felt like forever, but it was about 15 minutes. Figured the coast was clear. Went outside, hit the sidewalk, bam! He was right there waiting for me. He stepped up to me. He said, give me your watch, give me your wallet, give me your money. And I did. I was obviously scarred from that experience. But as I got older, that I realized that no one should have to grow up like that. I went to college, a good college, came back home, and said, let me give back to my community. Let me figure out how to deal with the physical waste that I saw growing up. I became an author, became an affordable housing developer, and spent the next 15 years learning about every real estate related development program, community development program that there was. And the best program to fix impoverished communities is gentrification. Let me give you one example. Right here, this theater. This theater was a parking lot 25 years ago, right? There was no need to have a theater here because Times Square was New York's red light district. We all know the story. It was full of porn shops, prostitutes, and drug dealers in the early 90s. 25 years later, I'm giving a TEDx talk, and you're paying 100 bucks to listen to that TEDx talk. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. <laughs> See, oftentimes, we conflate the bad outcomes of gentrification with the good outcomes, right? And gentrification means when more affluent people move into a community and fix it, but sometimes there's a displacement of the local residents there. Indeed, it's horrible when local businesses have to dislocate from where they are because of gentrification. And it's terrible when people have to move because of gentrification. But for those residents that get to stay, they have better public health options, public safety options, better retail options, and an overall better quality of life. So here's the question. How do we separate the bad outcomes from the good outcomes? How do we make gentrification a tool for community development? Well, here's the good news. Gentrification is predictive, right? It doesn't happen quickly. So there's ways to implement policies to, again, try to distill the bad outcomes from the good outcomes. But first, gentrification is predictive. There's two traits, and when I tell you this, it'll seem obvious, as to what leads to gentrification within an urban area. The first one is job growth. People come to cities to work, right? The second one is population growth. As people move to cities, industry and commerce builds up around the people moving to the city for that job growth. And that virtuous cycle creates gentrification within an urban area. Let me give you another example. New York City. Show of hands, how many people here are from New York City, born and raised? Raise your hand. All right, there's a few of you out there. There's a few of you out there. All right, so those few native New Yorkers, you can relate to this story. Between 1950 and 1990, New York lost one million people 
it went from a city with 8 million stories to 7 million stories. And you could feel it. Neighborhoods were emptying out. Crime was on the rise. And some said New York City was unmanageable. So what happened? Between 1990 and 2015, New York went through its greatest immigration boom ever, even more so than during the Ellis Island phase 100 years ago. 1.5 million people came into New York City in this 25-year period. Or to put it another way, the entire city of Philadelphia <laughs> landed in New York City. <laughs> and the transformation that you see here in New York today is a direct result of that. We lost our manufacturing base. We held on to our finance base. But New York City also became a city of media and new media, tech and high tech, healthcare and colleges. And again, New York transformed to what it was today. I did a lot of my work in Harlem. So people often ask me, Ed, what was the secret sauce to why Harlem turned around? And I tell them, it wasn't anything much, nothing special about Harlem. This happened throughout New York City. And that map right there indicates a number of neighborhoods around the core here in Manhattan that neighborhoods that gentrified. Harlem is one of them. Story in Queens, Long Island City, industrial dump. Williamsburg in Brooklyn, 25 years ago, another industrial dump, right? Low East Side, Jersey, Hoboken, Jersey City. These cities were nowhere 25 years ago, now heavily sought after cities. So again, now that we realize that gentrification works to fix the physical aspects of, of impoverished communities, how can we distill the bad outcomes from the good outcomes? Well, I have three ways, or three thoughts. The first is, let's keep the residents where they are. And we can do that through a form of, thank you, keep clap, thank you, thank you. Keep the residents where they are. And we can do that through a form of rent stabilization. Thank God New York City has rent stabilization. But we should do that in other cities that are going through gentrification. Because remember, gentrification is predictive. The second one is, let's implement some form of rent stabilization, even for local businesses. Because gentrification happens slowly. So cities could incentivize landlords to then give short-term stabilized leases to owners, to business owners, so that they can participate in the gentrification that's happening around them. And last, education. Educate local residences and local businesses on what's happening around them so that they can benefit from it. So did I already tell you about the second time I got mugged? <laughs> I'll save that story. I will. But what I do want to talk about is changing the conversation around gentrification. See, impoverished communities demand action, not words. I did when I was 10 years old. If we can somehow figure out how to have people living there in these impoverished communities benefit from gentrification instead of being overrun by gentrification, then we just may have something. My name is Ed Poteet. Enjoy your TEDx talk. <laughs>